the business. In today's hypermediated, overly social world, it can seem nearly impossible to find and connect with the right people who can help you kickstart your career, start your business venture, or launch your creative product. Well, we've hooked up with a pro who's no stranger to struggle. This guy moved to Hollywood with just the clothes on his back and started hustling. He eventually networked his way into becoming the go-to guy for the Grammy Awards, and he's built up his Rolodex and his contact list of who's who in the entertainment industry. Saturday, May 18th, we have Ron Roker. This is a man that Ryan Seacrest calls the Grammy guy. Ron Roker has worked with Mariah Carey, Justin Timberlake, Kelly Clarkson, One Republic, Gwen Stefani, Common, Beyonce, Bono, Carrie Underwood, Madonna, and the list goes on and on and on. And in this exclusive private online workshop, Ron will be teaching you tips and strategies on how you can market yourself, your music, your business, whatever project you have going on. You're going to be able to take away tangible tools, including templates for today's media alert and press release, ways to bundle existing social media content and press coverage to use for other marketing purposes so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're going to learn strategies on how to get more visibility locally and nationally inside and outside the music industry, creative ways to grow your fan base through social media, and specific steps toward nurturing, cultivating, and leveraging media relationships, starting with the ones that may already exist. Tickets for this event are $129.99, but if you go to businessbatterypack.com and hit our promo page, you can get your tickets for $99.99. That's $30 off. Now, already this course is valued at over $600, but Hit our page today and you can get it for $99.99. And we also have a contest where you can win a pair of free tickets to the entertainment marketing and social media training with Grammy Guy Ron Roker. So hit up the site businessbatterypack.com or you can call us toll free on our 800 number 1-800-465-7103. Do yourself a favor. Learn what it takes to successfully market yourself and learn it from the Grammy guy, Mr. Ron Roker. Welcome to another episode of Business Battery Pack Live. I'm your host, Davion, and once again, my co-host over here, Franco. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Franco, now the co-host of the newly successful hit Live from Hollywood TV with Lacey K. Summers and Simka. How's that show uh, working out for you over there, Frank? Uh, it's going pretty good. We just recently had a webinar with Ron Roker of the president of the influence group and we had a good turnout and we had a lot of information that we all learned yeah I hear you guys even get fan mail now so uh, <laughs> you know that's that, that's a little a little bit more than we've gotten over here at business battery pack when we started so good stuff so our guest today is the founder or uh, founder of learn the program TV which is a leading publisher of web mobile and game development courses that are used by individuals individuals and companies worldwide. Now, according to his bio, as a kid, Mark taught himself to program by writing games on his Commodore 64, which uh, that's an oldie but a goodie. I remember the Commodore 64. Um, today, Mark's passion is teaching folks how to program, and he's worked with con and consulted companies from Lockheed Martin, Discover Card, and the Department of Defense, all the way to Kaiser Permanente, Dell, and Target. So, Hailing from just outside Hartford, Connecticut, I give you Mark Lassoff, or as he affectionately prefers to be called, Mark. How you doing? Did I get that right? 100%. Thanks for inviting right. me on. I'm glad to be here. Well, thanks for being here. 
I want to um I want to uh what do you what are you guys working on right now? I just want to be nosy. What um Sure, yeah, we're we're actually working on a couple of different things. Um we've recently had a push to increase the number of external authors that are working on content for us. So we've got four new courses coming out geared towards teaching web development, software development, game development. Um, so we're very excited about the release of those. And we have also uh, are working on releasing our, our second book, which actually probably by the time um, this weekend is over will be available on Amazon and Kindle form. So we've got a lot of new content coming out, and, and since that's how we feed ourselves, it's, it's always exciting to see a new course or a new book uh, made available to the public, which is just a new stream of income for the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. I want to start from the beginning. Um, tell me about your passion for programming, and where did that come from? Well, I'm 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 at that uh, magic age where I think you know I'm really the first generation to grow up with computers. Um, I'm I'm just turned 39, and I had a computer from the time I was probably eight or nine. My parents were very encouraging of the uh, what the time was a hobby. Um, they thought it would be a good way for me to focus my time and stay out of trouble. And I taught myself basic programming uh, out of books, and when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, um, was writing very simple games and simple programs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always been a passion for me. Um, through high school and through college, it continued to be my primary area of interest. And most of my professional career has been spent in the IT or computing industry to some extent or another. And so it was kind of a very natural progression for me to work in the computer field. So did you, are you formally trained in computer programming also? Like, did yeah. you go to school for it? Yep, yep. I, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I studied computer science and communications there mm -hmm. and uh, had courses in, uh, mostly in the Java programming language um, and things called data structures and some, some logic courses. So I had formal training in computer science, but you know, most of what I use today, I actually learned on my own and, and could be learned on your own. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because, of course, things have changed a great deal since 1995 mm -hmm. when I get out of school. So you started at a very young age. That's correct, right? I was much thinner and cuter back then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, being that you grew up so, you know, in the, in the early 90s, I know there weren't as much computer classes as there are now so what I, I'm what I'm interested to know is how did you get started with that I mean did, how, how did you first start programming that's that's a great question I, I think you know back then people didn't know what even a program was what basically happened was back in I'm, I'm gonna go back now, even past the early 90s in, in the mid 80s um, the first personal computers started to come out that were in any way affordable. And they were still very expensive. But my father worked um, in an industry related to computers and actually brought a computer home from work. Um, and at the time, it was what they called a portable. It weighed about 75 pounds and, and uh, looked like luggage that you'd bring on an airplane. <laughs> but um, he showed me a couple things on it. And I started playing with it, and, you know, I really took to it. So then the next thing is, you know, my father and wanted to get a computer in the house, and the Commodore 64 at the time, I think it was about four or $500, very expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, he thought it would be a worthwhile investment, so he purchased one. And he didn't use it very much, but I did. Um, and like most kids, I liked playing games. But my curiosity went beyond that because... Just playing games I didn't find satisfying enough. I wanted to make my own games. And that's where kind of the passion started because I wanted to make games that came out of my own imagination, out of my own ideas. Because, you know, playing games, you're really playing in someone else's fantasy. I wanted to play in my own. So I found out the way to do that was called programming. Um, and so I found a book at whatever bookstore existed back then and uh, it was a book on computer programming. There weren't any books on programming for kids, so at age 11, I plowed through one for adults. I didn't understand everything in it, 
but I got enough out of it to get started. And that was that was this that was kind of the the specific beginning way back, back there, eighty six, eighty seven, somewhere back then. Wow, that's pretty impressive because, you know, nowadays with kids, they have computers and they have the Internet and, and they rarely do research at 11. And you're going to the actual library with the card catalog. <laughs> well, I, I, didn't, I didn't say I had many friends, so, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> wow, it's, what's interesting is, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was very interested in games and stuff also. And, um, you know, I, I made board games. And oh, wow. what was interesting is, you know, that sometimes there's a divide because I couldn't afford a computer. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think there's probably a lot of kids that if they had access to that technology, they could make remarkable things, you know. Oh, you the, 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 what they call the digital divide, I mean, that's not just something that goes back to when we were kids. Right. That's still going on. It's very unfortunate because kids who grow up in – less privileged environments unfortunately just don't have the access technology to technology even in their schools right. that kids who grow up in middle class environments do and it's 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 extraordinarily unfair and unfortunate because you're absolutely right a lot of those kids if they had the access could do extraordinary things mm -hmm. so you know that was a question i was actually going to um get into a little bit later but now is a really good time to uh, jump into it um you know do you feel that um do you feel that that well first of all I want to know why do you think more uh, programming isn't really taught in public schools like why do you feel like it's left off the table a lot Oh you're you're going to you're going to get me in trouble here but I'm I'm going <laughs> to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you what I think is the real answer and and that's yeah. because you know and and I'll just I'm going to preface this with some facts mm -hmm. um you know, there's a big talk, of, there's a lot of talk about what we call STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, right. those jobs, those are going to be the jobs of the future. And of those jobs, about 70% will be in computing. But the way we still train kids in school and, and young adults is we teach them chemistry, biology, physics, all important natural sciences. But chances are a lot higher that they're going to need computer science training in their career then they're going to need um, chemistry or advanced physics or anything along those lines. Not to make it seem like those subjects are unimportant. They are important, but computer science is just as important. Now, you asked, why don't we teach it? And to be honest, I think a lot of the reasons is the current educational establishment does not have the tools to do so and is not incentivized to create teachers who have those tools so when you say when you say the tools to do so what exactly do you mean uh, to be honest I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the the blame really lies at the foot of the educational leadership and teachers who don't have the computer science knowledge to teach and don't have the impetus to go out and get it there's nothing you know that rewards a teacher now who is teaching let's say biology or earth science to learn computer science and teach that not only that there's no accreditation in most states for computer science teachers I live in Connecticut you guys are in Virginia I don't know what the law is there or what the situation is there rather but here you cannot go to college and become a computer science teacher there's no certification the way there is for English or math or science or foreign language so teachers aren't incentivized to become computer science teachers and even more so the first thing that a lot of districts cut are courses like computer science and music and physical education so teachers get disincentivized because they put their own jobs and careers in danger by teaching those things instead of the more standard subjects which are more safe you know, you're, we're always going to have English teachers, so those jobs are safe. And until education advances to catch up with society, you know, we're going to have this, this, this divide. And it's a real shame because where it's been the most, um, the most uh, pronounced has been, believe it or not, in, in, in our current job market because we haven't prepared people for the job market we have now and that's why you see so much unemployment among recent college graduates yet we need to bring people over from other countries on H-1B visas to fill our programming jobs. It's an extremely unfortunate situation and it's not one that's easily solved because it really goes down 
almost to the elementary school level. It's going to take us a long time to dig out of this, and we're going to have to make some structural changes to education itself. Mark, that's a that's a hot 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 t uh, button topic you you hit on there, and I want to come back to it, but I want to back up just a little bit and sort of combine two of my questions together. Um, because it really goes off of some of the things you just said. What I want to know is, when did you decide to start teaching programming, right? And also, did you think teaching would be more lucrative um, than actually working as a programmer, or do you think that both are equally uh, uh, beneficial? Okay. So I started teaching in 2001. Um, and I started teaching because it's what I wanted to do. I did. And I had no illusions that, that it was going to be more lucrative than writing actual code. But I had always wanted to teach. And so the opportunity afforded itself in very early 2001. And this was also a time I was living in Austin, Texas, when uh, the dot-com bubble was starting to burst. Mm -hmm. So it happened to coincide at the time when there, there were a glut of programmers in that area, but not a lot of jobs. So um, I chose to start teaching, but, you know, in the end, I found a way to combine teaching and entrepreneurship that has been lucrative, and, and, and frankly, more lucrative than a programming career would have been. But at the beginning, it wasn't a choice about money. It was a choice about following my passion and doing what I really wanted to do and you know getting up every day and looking forward to going to work instead of getting up every day and dreading the work day and looking forward to Friday so it was really a decision about you know did I want to be happy or did I want to make twenty or thirty thousand dollars a more ye more a year and the answer was I wanted to be happy and you know when you enjoy what you do every day is the weekend um, and, and, you know, since that day in 2001, everything I've done has been because I've wanted to instead of because I've had to. And I've really enjoyed my career very much since then. So, um, you know, I know a lot of teachers. Um, I work with a lot of educators. And a lot of, especially younger teachers that are out here in the field, they feel frustrated um, because of the public system that they're into and, and, you know, it seems like sometimes maybe their best talents aren't being put to the best use. Um, did you deal with any of that when you were teaching or, or you know, what well, is your I mean, attitude towards that? Let's, let's be clear. I never taught in a public school system. Okay. I never okay. taught in a, in a traditional school. So I was free to, and I only, I only have taught adults. I have not taught kids or teenagers. Okay. Um, so I was free from the bureaucracy and problems that plague our, our educational system. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was more, probably more accurately called a corporate trainer, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I prefer being called a teacher because that's, that's the important thing that I do. Um, now we have students that I don't meet them live, but you know, I have students all over the world who are you know, taking our classes in a... Uh, you know, in, in, in online in a video manner. So in a way now I'm, I'm, I'm reaching a much bigger population. But, you know, I have a lot of friends who, who talk to my brother taught public high school. Okay. And, you know, I'm one of those people who believes that, you know, teachers are A, our most important resource and B, their own worst enemy. Um, you know, I, I know it's a very, it's a hot button topic, like you said, it's very political. But, you know, I really think A, we need to treat our teachers better and B, our teachers need to do better because, you know, they're really holding our future in, in, in their hands. And when it comes to technology, you know, I'm sure we're doing a great job teaching English, teaching math. Maybe we are. I hope we are. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to teaching technology, you know, a good example is that we have teachers who are going to extra or um, not extracurricular, but... Um, they're going to classes to learn how to teach kids how to use an iPad. And the idea to me is so absurd because my two-year-old niece can use an iPad. Mm -hmm. Kids but, naturally know how to use technology. It's right. the teachers who need to learn. Right, right. And I think we'd be better served teaching the kids how to actually break the thing apart and build it 
from scratch, you know, or build a new one or program you, you, it, right? You are so correct. I talk about this a lot. It's the difference between being a consumer of technology mm -hmm. and creating the technology. And we want our smart kids from all over the country to be creators of the technology. That's also, I mean, critical for the country. The reason the country succeeded, you know, back when we were succeeding to a greater degree than we were today, we were creating the new technologies, the radio, the television, computers, all born here. We're not creating the technology anymore, and we're not teaching kids to create the technology, and that's a big concern. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, I know you said earlier that uh, you wanted to be happy and, and become an entrepreneur and, and start your own teaching methods. So what I want to know is, because um, a lot of people – out there do have the entrepreneurial spirit spirit but they don't naturally become successful and you have become successful doing what you want to do so what I want to know from you is how did you make that initial first amount of income how did how did that how did you break that barrier and start making what you do profitable well let's 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 first be clear I failed a lot first um, and I think those learning experiences are critical to anyone who wants to do anything in entrepreneurship. If you don't screw up a couple of times, you're not going to learn the lessons you need to learn to be successful. Um, so I had a company called Power Plant Marketing, and it failed. Um, bankruptcy, worst way a company can fail. And I learned a lot from that. And why then, do you, why, I want to jump in real quick. Why do you sure. think, what was the thing that made that fail? What was your assessment oh, of what you did do right? Oh, 100% tried to grow too quickly. Okay. Tried when, to you grow say, too quickly. when you say grow too quickly, can you, can you give us a little more detail? Yeah. Um, I tried to grow before we had a product marketing plan that could profitably allow us to sell what we were selling over and over again within the market that we had. I tried to grow up beyond the market that we had and it's before we had proved ourselves in the market in front of us because okay. I was anxious to get big instead of get it right. Hmm. So I tried to get big first and we just couldn't sustain. We didn't have enough income coming in, had too many employees because we were geared up for big instead of geared up for success. So this time, um, this company Learn to program TV started with just me, and we put I we at the point me put one course up online, so I could manage that by myself. If it failed, I was the only one affected. When we failed power plant, I put four people out of work, so this only affected me. So the stakes were lower, um, and. Then once we had that first success, that first course, which was called Introduction to JavaScript, we started seeing monthly income from that. Well, then I decided, okay, there's a little too much work for me to do here by myself. I hired a gentleman named Kevin Hernandez, who now owns part of this business, and he started doing production for me. We put another course up and another. And so going back to June, almost a year ago, as, as we record this, going back to June... I, uh, we, we discovered all of a sudden there's enough income coming in and too much work for two people. So we hired Allison. So it was really the lesson I learned from failure and that initial success kind of com combined here because it was that lesson I learned from failure was to find a success and then iterate that success over and over again in order to grow. So Mark, um, I know that you had just said that um, that you had failed a lot and that you had made that one initial sale when you were doing your when you had started to become successful with this new business. So what I want to know is when you when no one knew who you were and you had to make that first initial sale, what was it that got the people to buy from you? I mean, how did you connect with the customers to, to make them trust you enough to, to purchase your course? Because I'm, I'm assuming that it's online, right? It is. It is. That's right. Right, right. So how, how, did, how, did, they, how, did, how did you establish that connection and that trust with your customer that they trusted you enough to put their information in that computer and to take your services? That's, that's such a great question because I think a lot of people just starting out miss this. And that's that you have to establish 
what I think is called social trust, and that may not be the exact vocabulary word, but you've got to establish that social trust. So the first thing, you, the first thing it's about is creating a, we created a course that was kick butt, just the best course out there. We offered more value than the next guy. We offered more value than companies that were established in this industry where you know they offered two hours of video, we offered four. Where they offered coverage of 10 topics, we offered coverage of 15. Where they just offered um, video lessons, we included code listings and interactive lab exercises. So we made the, I made the best course I possibly could. And that's the first thing, is if you want people to buy your product, whether it be a course, whether it be a book, or information or something you've created or invented, it's got to be better than the next guys. Because you're right, you're nobody. I'm, I was nobody. Nobody knew who I was. But the next thing was establishing that, that social trust. And do you know what I did is I gave the course away to a lot of people. And mm -hmm. those initial people I gave it away to, I asked them to do me one favor. Leave a review. If mm -hmm. you like it, leave a review. And those reviews started to give me the social trust that I needed in order for people now to say, hey, this course is five out of five stars. It's got 200 people in it. There's got to be something here that makes that's good enough because I want to learn this for me to part with my $49.99. Mm -hmm. So it's establishing the social trust after you've created the best product that you can. And I used to work for a, for a major training company um, years ago, back in 2001, and they, they had a saying that if you can't give it away, you can't sell it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in that. So I gave it away at first, and we st that's still central to our strategy is giving things away. Now, the other thing that does is we establish this relationship with potential customers mm -hmm. because when you give something to a customer with no obligation on their part except to you know, maybe leave a review if they feel like it, you also create some obligation to your brand. And affiliation. You've done something for them. You've given them something valuable. And you haven't asked anything of them. And that's how you start creating that community or that group of customers or your fan base, whatever you want to call it, that's going to make you successful in an online business. So, Mark, as, you, as you're giving your stuff away and as you're um, you know, establishing your social trust and, and building your, your fan base, how do you decide your price point you know, once you're going to start charging money? That's so tough. I mean, you know, typically, you know, economists are telling you, well, supply and demand. Well, how do you know what the supply is for a new product? Right. Or, you know, my supply is unlimited. It's digital, right? And you don't know what the demand is going to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's a matter of research. Um, I, I went on Amazon. I went on Udemy. I went on Safari Technical Library. I said, what do things like this cost? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the most expensive in the market. I don't want to be the least expensive in the market. And I picked a point in the middle. And then after that, monitored every metric I could regarding price to learn how to price the products. And now we've, we've, we've got a fairly simple formula that allows us to price our, our, our products. But I'd say there's still some judgment involved. But really, it's about taking the best guess you can and then monitoring metrics. For example, how many people get to the sales page where the price is revealed and they abandon the, the sale there? Hmm. That's a good indication that your price is too high. Or even, believe it or not, too many conversions can indicate your price is too low. Mm -hmm. you know, some people tell me, oh, I was selling my house in real estate. I sold my house in two days. And, you know, you're supposed to say, well, congratulations. And my reaction is, well, you priced it too low. Mm -hmm. Right? Because otherwise it, shouldn't, it should not have sold that quickly. Mm-hmm. So it's you know pricing is is, is and, and you know boy you, you could probably find fifty experts who could tell you more about pricing than I have, than I can but this is that's that's worked for us just you know take your best guess and then monitor everything you can to 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 see if you know you're losing or gaining sales or and find that find that sweet spot. So Mark, I want to ask something that's a little more in depth, uh, maybe some behind the curtains, uh, because if, for people that want to monitor their, their price points and maybe they're just getting started out, are there any tools or, or ways that you recommend that someone can get some fairly accurate metrics without, um, you know, uh, that can be somewhat specific or scientific? Yeah, um, well, obviously, I don't want to say obviously, uh, 
Google Analytics mm -hmm. is, first of all, it's free. So any mm -hmm. entrepreneur can afford it. Gives you loads of great information. Okay. What page people came on and on when they left. Did they complete the sale? All this information that you need as an online entrepreneur. The problem is, boy, it's complicated. It's hard mm -hmm. to use. And it's got terminology in there that I still don't understand. It's a, so, we need a course for that, right? <laughs> we do. We, we do. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one who's qualified to teach it. I'll be the first to right. tell you that. I'm just a programmer. Mm -hmm. But, boy, you know, if you spend the time to learn the terminology and, you know, maybe get a book out of the library, get a book at, at the bookstore or on Amazon about uh, Google Analytics, you're going to learn a lot. And, again, it's a free tool. There are paid tools out there, but I, I, we stick with Google Analytics. It gives us just about everything that we need as far as statistics, metrics, etc. about our site. Now, once you're past that, though, I got to tell you, the most smartest thing we ever did was we started calling our students and asking them, how come you bought this course? Did you consider any other courses? What did you think about the price? You know, we started talking to our students and asking them what we wanted to know. And they're your best source of information. And even though it's not, you know, statistics that you can put in an Excel spreadsheet, your students are going to give your students, your customers are going to give you the best information that, that you can. We've actually made some pretty big changes to the way we market our courses based on student feedback. We've even made some pricing changes based. Uh oh. <laughs> business calls. Business calls. <laughs> this is a first. We get a live, a live sales call. Uh, nah, we're, we're, doing we're, we're, just, we're just we're just silencing it. I apologize for that. But That's all right. It's all right. As we, we record this, it's Friday afternoon, and I let everybody go home early. Oh. Uh, well, it just lets lets people know we're talking to real people and not you know just some some random marketers or something like a that. So what, there you go. <laughs> it, it rings. Um, so you better be. I mean, talk like. So the point I was making is talking to customers mm -hmm. is incredibly important and, and, and really, I think, a key to success. Mark, I want to ask you this. Um, what would you say your share is of the, the teaching to the learning to program market? Like how, what, what kind of, um, you know, how many people are out there that are ready to learn the program? And, and how much of that market do you guys think you have? Uh, no idea, no idea. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. It's it's an amorphous market because you know every you could you could wake up tomorrow and decide you're in that market because you know someone told you there's a lot of money to be made in web design or you come up with a great idea for a mobile app or something along those lines. So the market is changing. What we did to try and give us the, as much information as we could is we came up with five composites of typical students for five markets that we thought we commonly hit. You know, one was someone who's already working in IT who wants to learn programming. Another was a high school or college student who wants to enrich themselves because they don't offer enough programming courses at their school. Those are two examples. And from there, we created our marketing around those, um, those conceptions of customers because it's very hard to measure this particular market. You know, you have some idea of, of how, you know, how many computer books were sold last year and, uh, you know, I think computer books were a, a, a $80 million industry or something along those mm -hmm. lines. But that doesn't necessarily give you the full picture. And then you've got to say, well, how are we measuring the market? Are we including people who are studying programming in college or in community college or studying online? Um, I can tell you that online education is... I believe the fastest growing segment of online commerce. Mm -hmm. So we know we're onto something there. But as far as specific numbers, I don't know, and I'm not that worried about it. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of room for us to grow. We're a very small player in this market. Um, Lynda.com, which is one of the bigger players, just had I think a $32 million investment from from uh, from an investment firm. Um, Another company, Udemy, which is a course marketplace, had a $12 million investment earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've, we, we've had an awful lot of movement in this sector, and I know we've got room to grow. And, and I don't think we'll become the biggest player in the sector. That's not really my business plan. 
but for people who are starting to learn programming, this sliver of this sector of online computer education, we, we will be the biggest player. But it's a very thin sector of a larger group that we're, that we're going for. So of, of all the courses you offer, what are the most popular ones? Like what's the best selling for you guys right now? Become a Certified Web Developer is our top course. Mm -hmm. um, it's sold into six figures. Um, and it, that's one of 15 courses we offer. Um, but that's our, our most successful. And it teaches everything someone needs to know to start doing web development. Um, so it's actually three courses in one. It's about 18 hours of video, uh, dozens and dozens of code examples, and um, and and uh, about 30 lab exercises. So it's a pretty extensive course. Mm -hmm. We sell that list for $200, but it does get sold often through discounters and things like that. Usually, average sales of that course is about 79 bucks. Um, but we've enrolled a lot of students in it to get to uh, in, into six figures and, and well into six figures at this point. How many of the courses do you teach, and um, of the courses that you don't teach, um, what do you look for in the in the, in the instructors that you select? The answer is I teach too many of the courses, <laughs> um, and we're trying very hard to diversify mm -hmm. because, you know, long term we want learn to program as a brand to have value outside of me, as as kind of the face of the brand. So I'm not going to be doing too many more courses for a little while, but we're bringing on other authors. What we look for is excellent communication skills, someone who teaches well, and tech, technical expertise, in that order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would think sometimes that might be hard to find in your field, too, because I, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not placing any judgment, but a lot of the tech guys I met are really uptight these days. What's going on with that, Mark? <laughs> a lot of, I mean, you know, tech guys aren't hired for their communication or people skills. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you look at, I mean, think of your nerdy friends who went into computers. They were the ones generally who were drawn to the computers because it allowed them not to socialize. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's actually a problem in the industry where we don't have great communicators or champions for our industry because typically great communicators don't go into this. However, there are a number of people who have great communication skills who can communicate technical information well, mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for. The technical stuff, if you're technical, you can learn. I can't teach you to be a good teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, and I think that's one of the secrets to our success, to be honest, is we look for people who are teachers first and technical experts second. Now, so, they, they may not have all the credibility that someone who's been programming for 40 years does in the classroom, but in the end, you're going to learn from our authors. And that's really been what consistently we've found, is that people like our courses because they feel like they connect with the authors. Awesome. So we're about to wrap up. Um, what I wanted to know was uh, basically are there any other areas uh, that you plan to expand your business into that you guys haven't done so far? Yeah, I think we're going to start uh, doing uh, you know, talk radio style hangouts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's a growing industry, I guess. <laughs> um, we'd like to expand into... Um, ancillary areas like design um, but not much beyond that we actually have a course coming out called Photoshop for coders which is our first um, which is authored and taught by Dan Udell mm -hmm. and that's our first kind of step into the non programmers market but we still feel like there's a lot of crossover so no we really want to dominate this one area we want to supply some ancillary courses but the business plan very much calls for us to dominate here mm -hmm. and become the most recognized brand in teaching pro people how to program and intermediate programming skills and we kind of want to leave it at that um, because you know I, one thing I learned from my first failure that uh, company called power plant marketing is you know know what you're good at mm -hmm. and for me I know I've learned what I am good at and what my team is good at and that's what we're doing now and to, to expand into an area that we're not good at only invites problems. Well, Mark, you, I, I want to, you poked a box here just a minute ago and it was kind of off the cuff and you were being funny, but I got, I'm curious. Um, why, what is it about something such as uh, 
a Google Hangout or podcasting or talking to guys, complete strangers like us, knuckleheads like us, uh, why do you do something like this? And, and, you know, what is the benefit you hope to get out of it? Wait a minute. You mean you guys aren't famous? <laughs> well, Franco is, but, um, you know, no one's seen me, so. My mo- I mean, to be honest, and this is, this is going to sound, you know, I mean, really simple. I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now, now, now I've, I've made two new friends here today. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned something about you guys and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, hopefully I've said something that uh, someone out there who watches this program or listens to the program will learn from. And, you know, they can feel free to maybe they'll reach out to me and I'll learn something from them. Um, you know, networking happens in all sorts of weird ways. Mm-hmm. And, you know, getting my name and my company out there, you know, it, it couldn't hurt. And you know, spending a few minutes with you guys this afternoon is, is going to benefit me, I know, because, you know, the right person will watch this. Or, you like you so said, you guys will know someone who can help me or my business. Or, you know, and, and if none of that happens, hey, you know what, I had a good time talking to you, and hopefully I've said something that's beneficial to somebody. But, I mean, you know, marketing today online is about getting your name out there and getting your company out there and you know I have no idea how many people will, will, will listen to this I hope it's a lot mm-hmm. but you know every every time you do something like this whether you appear on someone's podcast or you do a guest blog post you're furthering your reach out there in online media and since we're going for such a small portion of a large industry you know if the right person finds this that's that's one more customer, one more fan, one more friend, and that's that's really what it's all about. Awesome. We got to go. So leave us with uh, maybe two of your best tips for someone who is looking to start a business um, or for someone who is looking to turn their expertise into uh, mm-hmm. a business or a co- uh, training. So my first tip is don't look for outside investment. Build a product or book or whatever it is yourself first that you can sell and make that your your proof of of concepts um no one wants to hear about your idea unfortunately you know ideas are like armpits everybody's got two Um, (laughs) so you know you really want to have proof of concept so go out there and and do it and the second thing I, i would say is you know, don't let other people and their negativity towards entrepreneurship hold you back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if you ask some people that I know that an entrepreneur is another word for unemployed. <laughs> Not very um, <laughs> But don't let that type of attitude hold you back because those are the very people once you start seeing some success who are going to be the most jealous. Absolutely. So go out there and do it. You know, start it at night, start it on the weekends, start it, you know, with, with, with your newborn on your lap, but do something. Take that step, and you'll be glad you did. Awesome. You heard it here from Mark Lassoff, and his website is learn to program.tv. And uh, we're going we're gonna to post that up uh, when we uh, edit down this interview. Mark, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks. You have a great weekend. You too, gentlemen. All right. See you later, Mark. Bye-bye.